Construction is one of the most wasteful industries. There can be upwards of 40% waste, and I mean, that's just incredible. Every year, we're throwing away 170 million tons of construction materials. That is essentially the equivalent of filling the Empire State Building 710 times. The reason why that's a problem is because 30% of it is still reusable and salvageable. And we can use that, we can retain that value, extend the life cycle of those materials, and that lowers the embodied carbon of our natural resources. We know that climate change is a real issue, that the building industry contributes nearly 40% of the carbon emissions in the world, whether it is the construction process or the building operations. And so it's time to make a change. LEED is Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design, and it's a standard that is really a metric for sustainability, and it's, it's taking steps in the right direction for our projects. Now, it was an amazing thing that happened in the 90s for the industry to get folks thinking about how we can make an impact in sustainability. Now, now fast forward, uh, and more recently, there's also the Living Building Challenge, and that has kind of taken the LEED concepts and LEED was thinking about how can we do less bad, but Living Building Challenge is saying, you know, let's be regenerative. Regenerative buildings are ones that actually give back to the environment. Sustainable maybe just means we're taking less from the environment, consuming less material, taking less energy than we would otherwise, but regenerative is actually producing its own. Regenerative design means we have a future. How can we recycle and be net positive waste by actually taking material that was being demolished from other projects on its way to the landfill, capturing it and reusing it for a new building. The, the reason why I think the Living Building Challenge can become the norm is because it's so easy to understand. So the seven petals of the Living Building Challenge are uh, place, energy, water, materials, health and happiness, equity, and beauty. So there's a natural connection between the ambitions of the Living Building Challenge and the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, particularly Goal 6 on clean water and sanitation, Goal 7 on affordable and clean energy, Goal 9 on industry innovation and infrastructure, Goal 11 on sustainable cities and communities, and Goal 12 on sustainable production and consumption. They're pretty unique projects and there aren't very many of them, so Living Building Challenge is really the next level. It's, it's one of the most rigorous sustainable certification programs out there. And we need to be working you know, closely with manufacturers, with our engineers, with the contractor, in order to make sure that we get to the finish line, which is a regenerative project. My wife and I are both Georgia Tech alum, and this is a major undertaking, okay? It's, it's the first in the Southeast, and I just, I just knew that through all my background experiences at Skanska, our team is the right team to implement that at Georgia Tech. Having Georgia Tech on board was key. I mean, they're, they're, they're known for their technology, they're known for pushing batteries and, and being innovative. You know, Skanska has been a leader in that. For example, we've, we've, we have many lead professionals, hundreds of them. We've done hundreds of lead projects, and even with the Living Building Challenge, there's uh, roughly 29 fully certified Living Building Challenge projects, and Skanska has built or uh, advised on seven of them. There's 20 imperatives. You have to do all 20 to complete the full certification of the Living Building Challenge. Everything was connected to something else and, and did double duty, triple duty to make sure that this building operated holistically. Let's say the, the team was looking at the coffee cart and saying, you know what, we really want an espresso machine. Okay, espresso machine, yeah. Well, guess what? This is the challenge. You can't get that without thinking about, well, how much energy does an espresso machine use? Oh, well, if it's got that much of load over the course of 12 months, we need to add another 17 solar panels. Well then, that's on the roof and we don't have space for that. So now we have to add one more bay of structure and then that structure encroaches and shades our edible landscape. So now we have to 
widen our limits of disturbance, which, which recalculates, you know, it goes on and on and on with this living building challenge. Understanding how to put together a living building is not that hard. It's actually kind of unlearning a lot of lessons that, that we kind of I uh, maybe defaulted to in the 70s and 80s, and just trying to learn basics of how buildings need to operate in a passive way first. So for me, I actually had to step my game up. The human element at the Candida building was incredible. We, we had an integrated team, and uh, we really approached it that way. Connected construction um, is, is a new way to collaborate, a new way to communicate in a, in a digital way that, ha that has allowed us to, to communicate more effectively in person. When I think about connected construction, I think about collaboration. So I think about inviting all voices that are a part of conceiving of and implementing construction, right? and giving them the opportunity uh, to make the process more efficient. Technology helps visualize, it helps quantify, it helps sell the idea of sustainability in a way that we haven't been able before. We can do rapid takeoffs, rapid uh, prototyping and modeling in a way that we weren't able before, and that helps prove that these things are viable. And so the more that we can utilize technology in a w to, to prove our case, the more likely we're going to have regenerative buildings. So technology is really good at helping project teams manage trade-offs on a project like this. If you're targeting net zero energy, you need to know how the envelope will perform and to understand how design changes or material substitutions will impact sustainability, constructability, and cost. I think it's fascinating how technology can be used to solve waste problems in our industry. You know, this project probably wouldn't have been possible without the technology we have available today. There were so many changes and, and so many back and forth uh, with the design team, ensuring that we had the, the right design that was sustainable and that we could keep it in budget. And being able to have this technology, you know, and iterate quickly, you know, go back and look at multiple, multiple designs, you know, what they would cost and, and providing variance reports between the different options. Also empowering the owners to make quick decisions. So uh, by using these tools, we could show them what they were actually getting, how much it would cost, and they could make a very informed decision quickly, which helped us move forward in the process. So cloud-based construction tools are a major factor in our, in our projects now. So one thing is we want to have estimating feedback really quickly. You know, the design team is working in Revit. We're working in Assemble. Those get uploaded automatically, and then we can give feedback in hours and days as opposed to a, a month. We were receiving updated models weekly sometimes and going through multiple design options. And without Assemble, there would have been no way to do that in that short amount of time. Uh, using traditional 2D methods. So using virtual reality streamlined the change management process because instead of taking a large amount of time to flip through plans and specs and, and understand the costs associated with those, the owner can make a decision in real time by just walking through and experiencing the space and experiencing those different options. So then we're using BIM 360 and those models get imported and um, that ends up being our field coordination, our quality control. And then if there are any issues, we have the punch items in BIM 360. Really from start to finish, we're using an Autodesk tool to help us throughout that process. We knew that uh, controlling construction waste is part not only of the challenge, but an important part of what we do as architects, as, as builders. And so anything we could do to divert usable material from the waste stream was really important. There, there are so many impacts of material reuse. That's why Lifecycle Building Center was founded in the first place. We have so much abundance of resources and we waste too many of them. The story of Lifecycle Building Center really started for me for LEED. One of the credits within LEED is salvage materials. And after working on dozens of LEED projects, we would always skip over that one. I mean, we'd, we'd spend a minute talking about it, and oh, it's not feasible. And so that was really where the industry was, was ready for a Lifecycle Building Center to be in Atlanta. So we're at Lifecycle Building Center, and we're in a 70,000 square foot warehouse. It's an opportunity for people to come and donate their materials, and for others to come and purchase those materials and reuse them, repurpose them, and extend their life cycle. Building material reuse is not a new phenomenon. 
In fact, we're actually going back to how we used to remove buildings. But what we are about is showing the missed opportunities that are lost if you don't see the value of what we already have. So Lifecycle Building Center had a relationship with the local film industries, and they collected over 25,000 linear feet of salvage 2x4. Skanska then nailed those panels together and installed them in the building. That is probably globally the best example of salvage that ever happened. The, the key with salvage is if you get it on the way to the landfill, it's free. So at the Candida building, we saved a few hundred thousand dollars incorporating salvage materials there. So this, this is a sustainability element that does not cost more. And that's the beauty of the Candida Building Project. Once you're a part of a project like this, like the Candida Building, it changes you. The Candida Building is a blueprint for the future, and we want others to come see it and share, share our knowledge. I think the Candida Building is a great example of what's possible. So I know I'm talking about the Living Building Challenge as if we can do that for all projects. That's not the case right now, but we can think a little bit differently and make a big impact. Sustainability is definitely possible on any project. The real power, honestly, in the future of this industry does actually lie in how we design buildings in the first place. Take a moment, pause, take a step back, figure out what can be a salvaged, and make it happen locally in your community. I think there are many examples where sustainability is already a common practice for contractors and subcontractors. We just need to expand on those. Autodesk is committed to helping the construction industry play its part in decoupling the massive projected growth in buildings from negative impact, using technology to improve energy, material, and carbon productivity, and to doing it safely. I mean, we're doing things along the way where we're saying, you know what, that light is not getting in just enough and the energy consumption is, is gonna be a little bit too high in the future. Let's rotate our whole auditorium 90 degrees, drop that ceiling height 10 feet, and you know, let's see what that looks like in four days. Well, we, can't, we couldn't have done that 10 years ago. Sustainability, it's coming. Um, be ready for it, that there is change that it has to happen. And higher is just such an important kind of project type. It reaches so many people. It's the future. And even if uh, people don't understand all the technology that's behind a living building, we're hoping to, that uh, you're able to kind of learn by osmosis a little bit. The Candida Building is a truly inspiring project, but it's one example and sustainability only works if we scale it as an industry. Most people may not realize that the way that we design a building can actually change the future, but it truly can. Being able to see ahead of time, plan ahead, and think about how buildings are designed in the first place can create incredible catalytic change and for future generations. You know, I'm a mother, I have a seven-year-old daughter. I want this planet to thrive.